about that. You know me well enough to know that makes me smile. So good to have you here. If you're visiting with us, and I know we've got many visitors with us today, welcome to the Highland Church. I hope this is not the first time you visited with us, uh, but if it is your first time, we especially want to welcome you to our place of worship. And uh, there is a blue card in front of you if you would like to fill that out and let us know something about you or let us know how we can serve you that would be beneficial. You'll be able to put that into the offering plate. I'm going to give you just another second or two to settle in. Thank you. We do have some announcements that I want to make you aware of very quickly. We decided to hold this over one more Sabbath because we knew we would have visitors with us today for a a long time, for many, many, many years, um, a wonderful gentleman by the name of Hallie Glass was in this community and served this community. Hallie has just recently moved uh, to Arkansas, and uh, we've got a card that's going to be available in the lobby afterward. If you'd like to sign that, if you knew him from years ago and would like to just sign a, a farewell to him or, or give him a little message on how much he meant to you, uh, that will be available to you. Members, of course, you're aware of this too. This will be your last chance, so put something nice and we'll send that off. My phone is on power um, conservation, so it keeps going off on me. Uh, also, I want to make you aware, if you haven't heard the, the sad news, we lost Richard Trumper just recently here, a longtime uh, friend of ours here at Highland and used to, to, to be a staff member here at Highland. There's going to be a memorial service for Richard on March the 15th at 4 p.m., at our sister church at Oasis. So uh, mark that, um, Richard Trumper's memorial service, March 15 at 4 p.m. at Oasis. There's gonna be a Vespers right here in this building this evening. That will start at 4 p.m. And we would encourage you to come back and uh, make yourself available for that. You will be blessed if you do. And then of course this evening is our finale concert, our secular concert that will take place at 6.30 and that's over in the Rayfon Lay Auditorium, otherwise known as the Academy Gymnasium. And uh, you want to come early if you want the best seats. So um, the concert will start at 6.30. That's all the announcements that I'm going to make today, other than to just uh, once again say how privileged we are here at Highland to have you here. It is a, it's a joy to host this event I can assure you that there are many, many, many blessings that come with being the host church of an Adventist academy, and this is certainly one of those examples today. It's good to have you here. You know, I can speak for myself, having been here a few years now, we tend to take these events for granted, but let's just decide amongst ourselves today that we're not going to make that mistake, that we're going to soak this in that this is an event worth coming to, an event worth supporting. And I just want to say to all of our young people who are looking at me right now, and even those looking at their phone right now, we appreciate you. You are not the future of our church. You are our church. And the Lord is using you in a mighty way. So I just want to extend that welcome to you today. And as we continue now, I want to invite Mr. Watkins, our Highland Academy principal to come up. We have a little segment we call Faith in Action, and uh, it just uh, allows us to share with one another the things that God is doing in and through us as his, uh, as his servants. Thank you for being with us today. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It's a beautiful day outside. Amen. Well, the, the Faith in Action section of our, our church program every week is always one of my favorites because I just love to hear uh, the stories and the testimonies uh, that uh, my believers, your believers, all of us that we rub shoulders with on a weekly basis, the experiences that they go through. It just kind of grows your faith when you kind of hear the stories that they, that they have to share. You know, James tells us in chapter 2, uh, verse 17, that in the same way faith by itself without works, and I want to use the word action today, faith without action is dead. God is calling us to share our testimony. And this past Sabbath, this is something that we've been doing for a long time now, is what we call our spread the word Sabbath. We take our entire student body 
all of the staff members, every student that we have, and we vacate this campus, and we go to as many churches and our conference as we can, and we put on the worship service. So this past Sabbath was a high Sabbath, what I like to call it. If my friend Steve Rogers is here, that's what you say. We call it a high Sabbath. We had several activities going on on that weekend. We had children's ministries. John Bradshaw was here. Our students were out. We spread the word. Man, there were so many actions going on, so many things that were representing what we want to do to bring others into knowing his word. So we went to nine different churches, and for many of our students, it's the first time that they've ever been up front to give a sermon or a testimony or anything like that. But over time, it's pretty incredible to see my, our students, they're pretty much prepared for it now. Most of them, whether they're new or not, there's enough students now, they know this is what's coming, and they prepare for it. And you know, guys, sometimes it, it's so easy to just sit out in the pew. It's really easy to do that. But as we all know, and if you do a little research, you'll find that for most people, the number one fear is the fear of public speaking. The fear of public speaking, getting up and actually saying something. So we work hard at Highland Academy to try to encourage our young people to know that they have a story. They have a testimony. They have something to share and to not be concerned about who's sitting in front of them. Because for some of them, man, it's hard. It's one thing to go to a church where they don't know anybody. But to come in this church and to see the people that they rub shoulders with every day and do it, it's a little bit more difficult. Well, there's a lot of students that I could have asked to share. But this morning, I want to ask Karis McConnell to come up. Karis is, going, is from Louisville, and she's going to share her testimony with you. She actually came in our group when we went to Taylor Mill, Kentucky last week uh, and was sharing with that church up there. And so, Karis, tell us what you have to say this morning. How many of you guys feel like you don't have a testimony? It's pretty common. I used to also ask God why I didn't have a cool testimony. I would stand around and watch other people as they gave amazing stories of love and redemption. But every time I was asked, I would literally just answer, God's blessed me. I know he loves me. That was it. I didn't have some amazing story about healing or power or angels. I just had my existence and aware of that God loves me. So I would sit at camp meeting as kids and adults shared their stories. I wish I would had one, but I would just answer my usual answer. This was about my entire life until the end of eighth grade. And I was born with a aortic problem called aortic stenosis. It is when my aortic valve, instead of having the three regular chambers, only has two. That left me athletically limited, and I was usually self-limiting. In eighth grade, I went to the doctor, and they told me, yep, you're going to need surgery again. I was just going to get another valvuloplasty. Anyway, it wasn't going to be that big of a deal. We decided to wait until after summer. Uh, that summer, I went to ICC. I went to South America. It was all great. I come in for my ninth grade year, and by then, I'm having more problems. I get tired very, very quickly. Um, even just walking upstairs leaves me breathless. I have to stop and wait a minute. We went to the doctor, and yep, I needed another surgery, so they scheduled me. I went in, I was under, and as the doctor prepared to do the procedure, something stopped him. He said, Let's shoot one more shot of dye. I want another picture. So as he checked these pictures, he noticed something kind of strange. I had a tear in my aorta, a dissection, and that well, it could have led to a dissection that could eventually lead to an aneurysm. At any point during the summer, if I had overexerted myself, my aortic would have torn. I would have had an aneurysm. So I found out after my surgery that they had not proceeded, and so they sent me in for a Ross procedure a month later. I was given a cadaver in place of my, of my pulmonary valve, which they put for my aortic valve. And all of a sudden, I realized something. God had been saving me before I even known I needed to be saved. I had been walking around all summer, and God was already saving me because 
that dissection, that, that almost dissection, had spontaneously healed. And some of you may know that doesn't just happen. So after my surgery, I realized, God, you gave me a testimony. I now know that I am living my second chance. Now, God has saved me. He saved me before I knew it. And that is the most amazing thing. And some of us still believe we don't have a testimony. We may not realize that God is already working in us. Every day we live on a sinful planet is our testimony. Every day that we live for Christ, that's our testimony. We don't have to have an amazing story of redemption, healing, about angels saving our lives. We just need to know that God is already saving us before we even realize it. What a, what a great miracle story that was. Thank you, Kiris, for sharing with us. I want to invite you all to stand with me now as we sing our theme song here to start our day off. All together. I'm so glad. to turn and greet your neighbor this morning. Sing together one more time. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the baptism. Friends by his blood. Joyous with Jesus as we travel this Oh, you sound inspired to sing this morning. Let's sing our opening hymn together. Come Christians, join to sing. This will be hymn number 10. Come Christians, join to sing.
together. Lord, what a joy it is to be here in your presence today. Lord, we ask that you would accept this glorious music in honor of your son, Jesus. We pray that throughout this service, that your Holy Spirit would be in this place. You would fill our hearts. You'd fill our minds with words from on high. Thank you and join us in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, music festival participants. Uh, we are glad to have you here at Highland today. It bring back, brings back memories from when I was in a band and choir at Madison Academy some 45 years ago. Thank you to all the principals, administrators who have continued music in our schools. It is wonderful to have that. Our offering today is for our local church budget. This offering goes to support the operations and ministries here at Highland. One of these ministries is you, Music Festival. We are glad to open our doors to you to have you participate with us in church and supply us with worship and music. So any support to our church budget is greatly appreciated. If the deacons will come forward. If we'll bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, the giver of every good and perfect gift, as we, as we return to you our tithes and offering, use them for your honor and glory. May they be multiplied to hasten your soon return. Amen.
All right, at this time, we have a very special treat for our young people today. Uh, Pastor Greg Taylor, our camp director and youth, uh, youth um, director is here today for our children's story. Young people come forward. As they come, they do collect an offering for children's ministries here at Highland. Thank you for uh, helping us with that. Come forward. sit on the stairs here? Yeah, they sit, they sit all over. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Good morning. Did you bring your child? Is that? <laughs> wow. Wow. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Well, let me try the adults. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. All right. Now, the young people. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. We have some real young ones in the audience. Um, it, just ask them what's going on. They'll tell you a little bit later. But our, uh, some of our students from Highland are bringing their newborns. So uh, glad you guys are with us as well. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you guys a question and I want you to raise your hand. I might be able to take a few of you. Who here has something you're really good at, but, but, don't raise your hand yet. You're really good at this, but you never even had to try. You were just naturally good at something. You, okay, what do you got? What? Pickleball. 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 The first time you played, you said, I am meant for pickleball. All right, all right. How about you? Still thinking about it? Anyone else? Something you, you barely even had to try. What do you got? Math, all right, very good. Math just came, I didn't get that one. All right. <clears throat> I want to tell you this morning about a boy named Charles. Look at the person you left right and say, Charles. He had a very unique gift, Charles did. Because one day he and his friends were at the park and they started, I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but you ever tried to balance on like the, the sidewalk curb and, and try not to fall down? You ever do that? So he's going and his friends are going and his friends are falling left and right. They, they take one step and, oh, that kind of thing. They, they're falling left and right. But Charles is like, this is easy. And, and then he starts saying, this is so easy. He starts, he starts walking backwards on the curb. And his friends are like, wow, you're really good at this. And he says, well, maybe, maybe I am. A few years go by and he, he realizes, I really do have a gift of balance. And he starts to do some tight rope walking. Well, have you ever seen tight rope walking? Real high rope, and he's got a long pole, and he steps on the rope, and he walks, and guess what? This is easy. This is easy. He walks, he walks, he's not falling. People are like, you are a natural. You should join the circus. Guess what he does? He joins the circus, and he, by this point, becomes a crowd pleaser. He, he'll go, and, and he'll get in the middle of the rope, and he'll act like he's going to fall. <laughs> and everybody's like, <gasps> and then he'll look at him and be like, gotcha. And then just walk, because it's so easy. He's so good at tightrope. Well, here's what happened. A few years later, he got famous. And in the year 1859, Charles Blondin decided, I'm going to do something someone has never done. I am going to walk across the Niagara Falls. Now, he did the same thing. By this point, he was famous, so reporters were there. All kind, there was a crowd on both sides. Everyone was cheering his name, and he got, a, he, he got to the middle, and, and everyone's just like, this is the greatest thing we've ever seen. Guess what happened when he got to the middle? No, no he didn't fall. <sighs> he's a mathematician. He's doing the, okay, no, no, no. He, he gets to the middle, and he acts like he's going to fall. He goes, <laughs> and everybody in the crowd just, <gasps> and then he looks at him and winks. Gotcha. 
And he keeps walking. He goes across the Niagara Falls. But remember, he's a performer. So he goes to this side and he says, how many of you think I can walk across the Niagara Falls backwards? Oh, no, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He's going to do it. And so he does it. He gets the crowd riled up. He grabs it. He walks backwards. He gets to the middle. Guess what he does? A backflip. <laughs> wow. Wow. He wasn't that good, but he was really good. He has the crowd in the palm of his hands. They're beside themselves. They're scared. They're entertained. Until finally he says, this is a teachable moment. And he gets to one side, and the crowd is like a football stadium. They're roaring, they're smiling, they're cheering. And he says, how many of you guys think I can push someone in a wheelbarrow across the Niagara Falls? You know what they did? We believe you can do it. Yeah, everyone's cheering. Are you sure I can do it? We're sure you can do it. The crowd is going crazy. Are you positive I can do it? We believe you can do it. And so he said, okay, awesome. Who's going to get in? And the crowd went from, ah, and they looked at each other. You're going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Do you think he can do it? He can do it. I'm not going to do it. Well, well, don't you believe? Yes, we believe. Who's going to get in? And he was just having all kinds of fun with the crowd at this point until finally it was like slow motion. A young man jumped from within the crowd and said, I trust you. And he jumped in the wheelbarrow. And before people are thinking, no, no, where are your parents? They're terrified. Would you do this? Yeah. No? Okay. <laughs> Let me help. Let me help you out. No? <laughs> Jumped in the wheelbarrow, and he pushed him across the Niagara Falls. Like, you can imagine. I mean, they're ready to arrest this guy. They're terrified. The news reporters are going crazy. Instead of going straight to Charles Blondin, guess what they do? They go straight to the young man. What were you thinking? How did, what are you, th th how did you, what, and then finally, he said, how did you know you could trust him? To which he responded, of course I can trust him. He's my dad. You guys, would, would you trust your dad to push you over the Niagara Falls? No, that is the, that is the correct answer. <laughs> but I do want you to tell you this. Sometimes God calls us. Listen, listen, guys. Sometimes God calls us to do incredible things. But you know the beautiful, beautiful thing about it? Is he will be with you every step of the way. You think we can trust in our God, our Father? Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, you can go back to your seats. And I want you to think about it. I want you to listen about that in the sermon this morning, following God. You can go back to your seats now. In just a moment, Pastor Steve is going to have our, our pastoral prayer for us. But um, as the, uh, the musicians are setting up, I just want to invite you as we sing our prayer song, if you have a special request or a special praise, something on your heart that you want to just uh, um, lift up to the Lord, we want to invite you to come forward as, uh, pastor, as we sing together and join Pastor Steve down here, and we'll all pray together as a family. Uh, let's sing our prayer song at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we have come to gather together to worship you today through song, through the hearing of your word. 
and through talking with you. And up here is, are many people who have come with a special burden on their heart. We know that you know the thoughts of each one of our hearts and each concern that we have. We especially want to lift up those in Nashville, Clarksville, who are in the process of processing, recovering, and rescue after the tornadoes. We know that it is a uh, chaotic ex uh, time down there. We pray for a special amount of your Sabbath peace to cover those cities. And speaking of peace, we have come to you seeking peace in our hearts. And so at this moment, in the silence of our minds, we express our concern to you. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. We pray that you would especially anoint Pastor Greg Taylor as he shares a message from your word today. Guide us throughout this Sabbath day. Let all of the music that we do be honoring and glorifying you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Happy Sabbath, church family. Um, we are the Madison Praise Team, and we invite you to sing with us. The first song we will be singing is Who You Say I Am. And one of the reasons we chose this song was because, you know, sometimes we really don't know. I know personally as a teenager, you know, I'm going to school, and I'm trying to figure out what I want to do. And, you know, sometimes I come home, and, you know, I'm like, I don't really know what's going on. You know, math is killing me. Science is killing me. I, Everything's just a wreck, and like sometimes.
bow your heads. Dear Jesus, thank you for letting us be able to come to a church where we can freely be able to say your name out loud, be able to sing Hosanna, be able to understand who we are. Thank you for giving us an amazing life. Thank you for bringing heaven down. And we know that one day you're going to come back. And just thank you for everything. Thank you for being able to um, come to a school with friends and just be able to be around people that you have good in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. That is Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. I'll be reading from the New International Version today. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven.
been blessed this morning. Amen, church? Oh, I think a little, we've been blessed a little more than that. We've been blessed this morning. Amen? What a high Sabbath, what a wonderful Sabbath this is, and thank you, choir, for that reminder. Soon it will be done with the troubles of the world. My name is Pastor Greg Taylor. Just an honor to be with you, and it's an honor to sit back and just be blessed prior to preaching, too, just to hear those wonderful words, wonderful young people using their talents to praise God. And uh, thank you all. You've just been, you've spoken to our hearts this morning. What a, what a blessing it has been. What a blessing it has been. <clears throat> the title outside the church, I hope was not a little misleading because it says, Greg Taylor, follow me. That was not my intention. It was actually following Jesus, but uh, hopefully that will become clear in the few moments that we have together. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And I'd like to begin in the 18th verse of the fourth chapter. Matthew chapter 4, 18. If you have it, say amen. This is the calling of the disciples. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Pray with me. Lord, this is your time. I ask that I might simply be a servant. I ask that these words, this important message might not be my own. But Lord, may we see Jesus. Speak to us in the few moments we have together. We pray in your holy name. Amen. We are not told in the Bible if Jesus had bad dreams. I imagine if he did, they would probably be about Peter. You already know where I'm going with this. I love Peter. Do you love Peter? Peter makes me feel so much better about myself. You know, just, just the, the mistakes, he's jumping off boats, he's cup, cutting off ears, he's like getting rebuked by me, just, he speaks first, asks questions later. Have you, have you had a Peter moment recently? You know, where you get yourself into trouble and you're like, how did I get here? I have those all the time, all the time. My friend, I love telling this story, time is short, so I'll tell it quickly, but uh, I think especially the academy campus can appreciate this. 
They always give you your yearbook, like with a day or two before final exams, you have barely any time, and you know what the tradition is on an Adventist campus, right? You have to get everyone's signature in your yearbook. That's kind of a thing. You know, you want to remember them always. In this particular, my friend Tony had a Peter moment because he was very popular, a spiritual leader on campus. And, and so everybody wanted to have Tony's signature on their yearbook. I mean, the seniors, the juniors, sophomores, the freshmen, they were piling yearbooks in his locker. Tony, you've got to sign my yearbook. You've got to sign it. And Tony, being the spiritual leader on campus, he said, okay, I'm going to do this, but I can't possibly sign all these yearbooks. I've got to summarize what I want to say. What is the best thing I can leave with, with my student body? And so he said, I really can think of nothing better than for I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. Beautiful verse, amen? What better thing to say? And so instead of writing it all out, he simply says, always remember Jeremiah 28, 16. Always remember Jeremiah 28, 16. And he goes, he gets all through his seniors, Jeremiah 28, 16, always remember. He gets to the, the, the juniors, oh, I just, oh, they're, they're hugging, they're embracing, they're crying as they're saying goodbye. Always remember Jeremiah 28, 16, gets to the sophomores, gets to the freshmen. He's even signed all the yearbooks. Some of you are looking ahead. <laughs> this is a true story, by the way. And then it hits him the day before he's graduating. My teachers, I love my teachers. My teachers have meant so much to me. I need to leave a message with them. So he goes and knocks on their faculty housing. Can I please sign your yearbook? You've meant so much to me. Always remember Jeremiah 28, 16. It's by English, his English teacher was his favorite. It was like close to midnight. He was past curfew. He could have gotten in trouble, but he says, I can't miss this opportunity. He goes to his English teacher, knocking on the door. Please let me sign your yearbook. Finally, have you had a Peter moment? <laughs> Finally, at about uh, one in the morning, one of his senior roommates <laughs> came and knocked on the door violently. He didn't quite, um, he says, Tony, I know you're trying to be funny. I don't think it's funny. Tony's like, what are you talking about? What you wrote in my yearbook. What are you talking about? This is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. For I know the plans I have for you say, that's not what it says. You're thinking of Jeremiah 29, 11. And it's such a privilege to put these words on the screen for you today. This is what Tony wrote in everyone's yearbook. <laughs> Therefore, wait, wait, wait for the effect. Have you, have you had a, a Peter moment? Can't you see Peter doing this? This is what he says, therefore, this is what the Lord says. I am about to remove you from the face of the earth. This very year you are going to die because you have preached rebellion against the Lord. Everyone had this in the yearbook. He's going hallway to hallway, scratching it out, scratching it out. He, he goes past curfew again, jumps behind the dorm, jumps out the window, runs to his English teacher, knocks on the door. It's like two in the morning. He's like, I, I made a mistake. You got to, she says, no, 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 no. I want to remember this forever. <laughs> and so to this day, uh, in the teacher's yearbook at Great Lakes Adventist Academy. She has been sworn to die that very year by one of her favorite students. Have you had one of these moments? I, I loved Peter as a kid because, I, he, I mean, I, 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 I'm embarrassed to say this, but I told my mom, I used to have those G.I. Joe figures, and I convinced my mom that on Monday through Friday, it's, it's Sergeant Slaughter, but on Sabbath, it's Peter. So I could play with him. I said, look, Mom, he's cutting off ears. You know, I'm trying... Peter was action-packed, and he did so many things where he put himself in bad situations that I kept realizing if Peter can do it, if God can use Peter, he can use me. Thank goodness for Peter. But this passage we're going to spend just a few moments with has always challenged me as a Christian, as a fan of Peter, and I hope that it will challenge you. I want to invite you. I'd like to hear everybody in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 14. I want you to see this. This is one of the most challenging verses for me in the Bible. And I'll tell you why. Maybe you'll see something you haven't seen before. Matthew chapter 14 
And I'm going to start in verse 22. So Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. If you have it, say amen. It says this, immediately, this is again, Matthew 14, verse 22. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get on the boat and go with him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went to the mountaintop to pray. Now when the evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the midst of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Verse 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, the summer between 3 to 6 a.m., Jesus went out to them walking on the sea, like you do. <laughs> and when the disciples saw him uh, walking on the sea, they were troubled. It is a ghost, they cried. But immediately Jesus spoke and said to them, be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Continue on. And Peter, this is the part. Listen to this, friends. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus, so he said, Come. And when Peter had come down on the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. This is the part we usually focus on, verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, and said, oh, you have little faith. Why do you doubt? We usually stop there and say, have more faith, let's go to potluck. That's usually about what the message we want you to get. Keep, keep reading just a little bit further. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. My friends, oh, this is powerful. There is a huge lesson in keeping our eyes on Jesus, amen? That's there. That's definitely powerful. That's definitely part of what this story is teaching us. But every time I read this, it challenges me because I like to put myself in the story. And the first question I ask is, why did I even think about getting off the boat? Are you with me? We talk about step four and step five where he starts falling, right? But for a moment, I want you to consider what about step one? Are you with me, church? What about step two? What about step three? Let's, let's, let's unpack this just a little further. You still have your Bibles open. Um, it's interesting. Uh, if, you, if you look at Matthew chapter 14, you go a little bit further. This is a terrible, busy, I mean, this is a busy weekend for Highland. I imagine for Jesus it's even more. So much has happened. His friend John the Baptist, what's just happened to him? He's just been killed. He's just been killed. It's on his heart. It's heavy on his heart. He wants to take time with Jesus. And when Jesus had heard that this had happened, he departed by boat to a deserted place. Listen to this. <laughs> but when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot to the cities. I don't know if you realize this. Pastor Roger, have you ever preached a sermon and you just need a moment, just be by yourself, and then 5,000 people follow you? If <laughs> Jesus has just lost his friend. He, he's going to be by himself and instead a crowd of 5,000, and that's just men. Women and children added, follow him. What happens next? You see it in your Bible, right? Instead of having a few moments by himself, he begins to preach, and they run out of food, and they had this incredible miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Now, it's interesting, if you read the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White makes it very clear that there started to become a rumbling during this miracle. They started to say, you know, we've got the people here. We've got Jesus doing a miracle. This might be the time that we can force him to be the king. The disciples start getting in on it. There's some rumbling, like this is our time. And so as we get to the end of the story, verse 22, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and there go uh, and to the other side. And he sent the multitudes away. The, the word sent is not just like, hey, see you guys later. This is a forceful, you better stop your plan <laughs> because I'm not here to be your earthly king. Are you with me, church? And in fact, the spirit of prophecy tells us that the disciples, they didn't go when Jesus told them to go. They sat by the shore because as soon as Jesus is done, we might be able to make this happen. We might be able to be force him to be king. So a lot of tension, a lot of drama as Jesus goes up and spends time. And if, I, if you permit me just a quick side note, friends. If you have 15,000 people there, there was still more work to be done by Jesus they, I'm sure many of them would love to hear another sermon. But the Son of God says, I can't be about my Father's business if I do not spend time with my Father. Friends, if the Son of God had to do that, don't we? It's okay to say, no, I need to take time with my Heavenly Father. Now I want you to also remember one other thing. 
what was Peter doing when he was called by Jesus? I mean, I guess it's more like this, okay? He was fishing, right? Do you realize what that tells us about Peter? I, I was in, in high school, actually before high school, I was in eighth grade, and in eighth grade, um, I was, I hate to admit this, especially to the young man who was sitting here, I was not real great at math. And we had students in our class who were so good at math that they were dismissed during math class to pick up their books and go down to the high school end to take the advanced math. And sometimes, you know when a batter hits a home run and he runs just a little too slowly? That's kind of how it felt to us that stayed behind. You know, they would pick up their books like, if you try a little harder, <laughs> you could join us in the advanced group. <laughs> kinda, it, it was really frustrating and that happened all the time. I imagine Peter, to some extent, felt like that because he was not the smartest. He was not the best. He was not the elite. In fact, he would see people walking by and thinking, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a fisherman. I took up the trade. I, I couldn't keep studying where they're studying. And in fact, these words that, they, that eventually were offered to, to Peter, he should have never heard. See, the, 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 the Pharisees, the teachers, the rabbis, they would look at a specific disciple, a specific student, and ask themselves one simple question. Can this person carry on my work when I'm done? Can they keep my work going after I'm set, after my time is up? Can they follow in my footsteps? And so the, the, the students would follow, and they, the, the phrase was, may the dust of your rabbi be upon you. They would follow so close behind their teacher. And so I'm sure when Peter, it must have been a funny moment, when Peter heard those words from Jesus, follow me, he must have looked behind him. Is there, is there, a, is there a student? Is there a scholar? And then realizing Jesus is looking directly in my eyes, and he said these words, follow me. And all of a sudden, Peter understood what is Jesus saying. He's saying, I think you can do what I do. You can carry on my work after I'm gone. I'm calling you to follow in my footsteps. Someone say amen. This is why Peter was so radically willing to do this. And, and friends, if you think about it, what would compel anyone to jump off a perfectly good boat in the midst of a storm, even if it's a bad boat? One boat is better than no boat, right? You have, no one else is getting off the boat. No one else thinks this is a good idea. Why did Peter think this is an idea? But in his mind, he's thinking, he's called me to follow him, to do amazing things. Now, I want you to think about this, friends. That moment, Peter asks God to call him forward. Jesus calls him forward, and he takes that step out. Now, if who, who's on the boat? We know as other disciples, we don't know which ones, but you know Peter. You have dirt on Peter. You know what Peter's done. And yet here he is taking one step, taking step number two, taking step number three. Miracles are possible when we depend on Jesus. Amen. What is impossible with men is possible with God. He believes that you can do, he's called you to follow him. I love in, in Desire of Ages it says, when trouble comes upon us, how often we are like Peter, we look upon the waves instead of keeping our eyes fixed on the Savior. Our footsteps slide and the proud waters go over our souls. Jesus did not bid Peter to come to him only to perish. He does not call us to follow him and then forsake us. Fear not, he says. For I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by name. Thou art, what's it say? Thou art mine. And so here's Peter taking that step. And we often talk about have more faith when he takes his eyes off Jesus. But can you imagine seeing your friend taking step number one, taking step number two? Friends, what I want to submit to you today is we have never had a, a society is so in need of Jesus. Someone say Amen. We, we, we see the, the, the terror happening. We, we see these, there's tornadoes, there's viruses, there's, there's a terrorism, there's all kinds of stuff happening. There are people, when the world is saying hopelessness, do you know what we need to say? No, there is hope in Jesus Christ. There is a world in desperate need of us getting off the boat. Someone say amen. Have you seen this picture before? I love it. Next one, I think it is. <laughs> Does that just about say it? But it's so comfortable in my comfort zone. It's so comfortable where I know where things, I know what to say. And my friends, oh, I'm 
Are you going to say, Greg, you're going to say it. I'm going to say it. I might get in trouble for this one, but Elder Rose is, oh, Elder Rose is here. I'm going to say it anyway. Living out your faith is more than just handing out a brochure. Come on, someone say amen. It means building relationships. It means going to where people are, meeting their needs. What is, what, what is, what is the, the beautiful passage that we have? Jesus mingled with those as one who desired their good and co- bid them come and follow me. Are we doing that? Or are we comfortable? This last week I had the opportunity. Some of your students in this conference, it was, it was awesome. We, we were able to go to Nashville. Have you seen these pictures? Total devastation. You, you could look in a window and still see the bed, but there was no wall. Um, go to the next picture. Trees, cars, branches. Uh, just, just incredible. In our backyard, and I can't tell you the, how proud I was of our students who went down there to meet a need. Going down there to say, we're going to be Jesus' hands and feet. And by the way, for those of you guys who haven't made that decision yet, there's still a lot to do. They could use you. But this is what it means to get out of our comfort zone, to do something, to say, I refuse to stay where I know. So often we say the words such as, well, what if I don't know what to say? What if I can't answer the questions that they ask? I don't have the degree. I don't have the experience. Check it out, my friends. God never said, I need your degree or your experience. You know what God says? He says, I need your willingness. I need your willingness. I'll give you what you need. I just need you to get off the boat. The second thing I like to, I'm not going to go much longer, but the second thing I like to share with you, this, the main point is simply this. We don't know, we don't know who else was on this boat. We don't know which the disciples, how many of them. We don't know how big the boat was. We can guess, but we don't know for sure. But what if, listen to this church, this is powerful. What if The fact that Peter got off the boat, took his step of faith, he was willing to say, they'd seen Jesus do miracles, but to see Peter? What if Peter's decision to get off the boat, what if that's what John needed to take his own step of faith? To to live through persecution, through exile, to to endure, to to be able to give us the book of Revelation. What if if Stephen, as he's looking up, seeing Christ at the right hand, and he's, he's praising God in the moment he's about to die? What if seeing Peter take his step was what Stephen needed to take his? Someone say amen. The other disciples, what Philip, the evangelist, the others who died as martyrs. What if seeing Peter, what if, here it is, what if Peter's act of faith was not just about Peter? But what if God calls us to get off the boat, not just for your own faith, but for those around you? Because there are others watching. You're familiar with this, I hope you are at least the, the, the emperors, I'll tell history in a nutshell, the emperors decided shortly after this time we need to snuff out Christianity. Because of the young ears in the audience, I won't go into details, but they decided we're going to get rid of Christians in grotesque, terrible ways. The, the gladiator coliseum being one of them as the, as the opening act for the gladiator games, we're going to destroy Christians. And we have historical records, not even faith accounts, but historical records of, of, of people looking down, cheering on the crucifixion, the death, the brutality of these Christians dying, cheering it on from the stands. And what were they doing as they were dying? Singing praises to God. Now, I, what I'm about to say, I don't know if you can think of a better, a, a better analogy of what's happening today, but, but th- check out this. Those in the audience, they're, st- they're first cheering on the death of Christians, and then they see them at the moment of death, praising God, filled with the Holy Spirit, believing in something so strongly until the audience says to themselves, is there anything in my life, come on now, church, is there anything I believe in so strongly that I would do that? And the opposite thing happened. You know this. The blood of the martyrs was the seed of the Christian church. And those looking down, seeing they're willing to die for this man, I need to know who this is. And instead of snuffing out Christianity, friends, it exploded. It exploded. I want to challenge you, and I want to submit to you, that today, we still have an audience looking at us. Wanting to know, do they really believe what they say? Are they really willing to live and, 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 and go all the way in? What about, what about you, friends? What does that look like? Most likely it's not a fisherman's boat. But what does that step look like for you? A coworker, A neighbor? 
Maybe it's that ministry you've always thought about being involved in, that huge God-given opportunity you've got comfortable ignoring. What is that state, that, that step for you and I? And what if taking that initial step of faith, listen to this church, what if taking that initial step of faith is more important than the initial discomfort it causes? Whew. The initial awkwardness. I was a teacher when I first started out of college. And uh, I was a chaplain, Bible teacher, taught history. It was a small school, so you touch about it, just about everything. That's how it goes. Um, and and uh, they asked me to, te- to coach a basketball team. And uh, I do love basketball, and I, started, and I agreed to do this. And it was a, we, only, we didn't have a junior varsity. It was just one team, and you can take about 12, 12 players. And uh, long story short, we, uh, we started, I started getting wind that there was a lot of people wanting to be on this basketball team. And the day, the first day of tryouts came, um, you can take about 12. I had about 25 guys show up. And it just, I mean, my heart, I'm like, I don't, th- I can't say no to so many kids. It's going to hurt their feelings. You know, I don't, I can't do it. I was a very young teacher. Like, <laughs> you'll understand that in a few moments. <laughs> and so I thought to myself, instead of, you know, having to say no to so many kids, you can't be on the basketball team because you don't have enough room for you. I decided, this is one of my Peter moments, by the way. <laughs> I decided I'm going to make tryouts so hard. <laughs> That they will drop out and say, I don't want anything part of this basketball team. I know I'm terrible. <laughs> I'm terrible. But I did. And in fact, I, I, we, had a, we had a football field outside. And so there's, there's called a line drill where you go back and forth and back and forth. You usually do that on a basketball court. I decided we're going to do this on a football field. Yeah, I'm terrible. I'm terrible. So just to, t- 10 yard line, back. And you had to jump and catch your knees five times. 20 yard line, back, catch your knees. 30, 40. 50, keep on going, 40, 30. I was like, this will do the trick. And I started them, and they were all excited because they wanted to make the team. And about two laps into it, I saw people getting a little woozy. I saw some other people looking like they weren't going to make it. Their, their skin tone changed. And <laughs> I, this is my second year of teaching, and I started thinking to myself, I'm going to kill a kid. I'm going to kill a kid. I'm about to kill, I, that, this can't look good on a resume. <laughs> I'm about to kill a kid. What am I going to do? And so, so finally my point guard, he was in first place, and he was running. And so I kind of, you know, started running backwards with him like, hey, uh, Justin, his name's Justin. I think, I think this is wrong. I probably need to, I, I, should I, should I? I'm trying to ask him, and he's like, no, it's all right, it's all right. I'm like, okay, 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 okay. I've got the whistle like on my lips ready to stop it. I'm terrified, you know, I'm. And so Justin goes, and he continues, and I'm, I'm about ready. I'm just, I, I can't have a dead kid on my hands. I can't do it. And so finally Justin came by again, and I caught up with him again, like, hey, I think this is too much. I really think, don't, you know, this is right, this is too much. He stops, and he looks at me, and he says, coach, they'll follow my lead. And I stood back, I was like, Okay. Justin finished 2010, full thing, and then guess what Justin did? He went back to the kid in last place and ran with him. And the other kids ran with him and and paced them and helped him get to this. He helped all 25 kids finish this activity. Right, it's a great story, but I still had a problem, okay? (laughs) But all they needed, friends, all they needed was someone to follow. Someone to set the pace. Someone to show them how to go, how to live, how to get past this difficult time. Church, are you hearing me? What does it mean to get off the boat, to follow him in some of the crazy ways that he calls us to? Kim, I want to, join you to invite you to come join me as we, as we close. But that fourth step of Peter when he fell was not his last time falling, it was it? In fact, I can't even imagine, I've done some things I'm not happy about in this life, but can you imagine the rooster crowing after the third time you've denied your best friend? You've rained down curses on your best friend. John chapter 21, if you'd like to turn with me. John chapter 21. Now Jesus, the, the amazing thing might be what Jesus did not say. 
If Jesus had come and saw Peter and, and, and just let him have it and said, you know, Peter, I really needed you. You let me down. Peter probably would have been okay with it. But that's not what Jesus did, is it? John chapter 21 and verse 15. I love this. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than those? These. Peter, not being the smartest one on the block, didn't get it yet. <laughs> he said, yes, you know that I love you. To which Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter might have started to suspect something was up at this point. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Take care of my sheep, Jesus said. But I imagine the third time it finally hit him. Simon, do you love me? It says Peter was hurt because he said, he had asked him the third time, do you love me? He finally got it. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. See, the beauty of this, it wasn't a guilt trip. It wasn't a matter of like making things right or evening things out. It's a matter of Jesus said, you've fallen, but I'm not just going to bring you back. I'm going to put you back on the path. I'm going to put you back on a journey of sharing my love with others. That's the God we serve. Amen. This song is called The Greatest Friend of My Life. It's all about the life of Peter. to the thousands, healed the faithful, made the blind to see. He taught me a virtue and the ways to joy, found through the eyes of God. My life was changed, I followed my Savior as if nothing could go wrong. For that's the day I met. The greatest friend of my life. Who, who, who? The night had come. He found me sleeping. He cried to God for strength. I remember him crying. I could see the terror as the guards rushed him away. I followed my friend, I tried to stay by him, but soon I was recognized. I told them they're foolish, for I don't even know him. I denied my Savior three times. For that's the day I left, the greatest friend of my life. Who, who? I saw my friend beaten on his way up to Calvary. He was bruised and bleeding and hung on a cross for all the people to see. They cursed and they mocked him and they placed up a mantle, saying, this is the king of the Jews. But Jesus looked in their eyes with love and forgiveness. Forgive them, they don't know what they do. For that's the day I lost. 
the greatest friend. Who, who, who? And three days later, my friend had gone. I could not erase what I'd done. He was the greatest man to ever walk this earth. We crucified the Father's Son. Then in an instant he appeared to me. From the grave he had risen to life. He said to me, Peter, do you love me? I'll love you for the rest of my life. He said, I'm going back. To my father's Ooh. mansion, please tell Ooh. this word of my love. And fear Ooh. not, Peter, for I will be with you. I love Ooh. you, for you are my son. Yes, I, I remember, remember that day, day I can see it clearly. clearly. The, the day, day I met, met my friend. And I will tell this world of the love of the Savior, and soon he'll come again. For that's the day we'll meet, the greatest friend of our life. Yes, that's the day we'll meet, the greatest friend of our life. Stand together for our benediction. Stand. Father, what a joy it's been to be here today in your presence. And thank you for the challenge that we have all heard to trust Jesus enough to follow him all of our days. Lord, help us to leave this place today committed to doing just that. Go with us as we separate one from another, knowing we never are separated from our best friend, Jesus. We pray in his holy name. Amen. You're dismissed.